Okay, Zoomers will be coming back in just a moment. There's Patricia. Patricia in Colorado. Pat nice to see you, Patricia. Yeah. <laughs> oh, can't hear you, Patricia. You're on mute. Yeah. Good morning, welcome back. Zoomers, you can hear me okay? Are we all here settled in? Yep, got our drinks, we're ready. Uh, it's a, with great privilege that I get to introduce uh, our co-founder, Roshi Jun Rayushin Tanoi. Uh, she does not need an introduction, but I will give her a little bit of one. Um, our co-founder, fully empowered Zen priest, um, Zen master and also leads our mindful movement here with her own hula school as a kuma hula teacher at the Chau, a e kapono school of hula. This morning's talk will is entitled "The Dragon," per, the the black, the black dragon jewel. Thank you. I'm out of here. It's okay. Thank you, Junmei, Kelly Junmei. Can you hear me okay? Is No, you can't hear, not so good. How's that, is that better? Not that great. Huh, I wonder why is that? Okay, how's that? If I speak louder, it probably will help, right? Is that good? Okay, all right, here. How's that? Is that better? Is the same. It's not. Okay. <clears throat> okay. How's that? Uh, how's that? How's that? I think it should. Is that? Is that good? Ooh, it's right there. <laughs> okay. That's really close. Uh huh. Wait a minute. See, how about that? Is that good? Is that better? Okay. So, yes. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here today. I am the new Mark Galula because Mark was supposed to speak today. If you were here for his talk, I'm, you know, it's me instead. <laughs> okay. So, um, <clears throat> last night I went to this great Bravo performance at uh, Longfellow School. Longfellow? They have a beautiful auditorium. It was Beauty and the Beast. And one of my former hula students played the lead. Well, there are two leads, right? Different shows. Nova B. B.E.A. Krauss, and she did a great job. Oh my God, she was beautiful singing and acting and everybody, the whole cast. Oh my God, those, those group numbers are incredible. I don't know if you've been to a Bravo performance late, lately, but they have a, a screen that is, it's huge screen. It's like you're in the castle. It's like amazing for those of you who do, you know, performances. And I was just amazed, just really beautiful. <clears throat> so the title of my talk, The Black Dragon Jewel is Everywhere. Um, I got this from, you know, the reading circle, the study circle that Sky Jigen Lavin is 
holding is studying this book that I got this title from. And it is Ed Espy Brown's book called No Recipe. <laughs> no Recipe. He was the one who in the 60s did the classic Tassajara bread book that, you know, even Roshi used that book to make bread. He had all bread in the book, you know, right? Because you're, anyway, um, so Ed Brown is um, a Zen priest. He studied in the Suzuki Roshi lineage in San Francisco. And he's really down to earth. He was a cook at Tassajara, you know, the Tenzo, the head cook is quite an important position, right? Because everybody's sitting hard. And the one thing that really makes or breaks their day is the meal. Well, not, not always, but because <laughs> I used to be the Tenzo, right? I started as the cook. When we started doing sessions in 1994, I think it was small, it was like weekend sessions. Every now and then we'd have the long one, just as we were beginning our Zen Center in the beautiful pasture lands of Hawaii, Waimea, Hawaii, and a full view of Mauna Kea, the great mountain. If anybody has been, been to the big island, you know that mountain. So one of the first things of Dogen that I read to prepare myself to be Tenzo was his Tenzo Kyokun, or instructions to the cook. This was instructions to the cook in, in those big Japanese monasteries. So I mean, you know, the head position was like, I mean, how many people would they have, right, in the monastery? sitting for session that they had to cook for a lot of people. <laughs> and I had maybe, ooh, 10 or 15 was a lot. Even here, 10 or 15 is a lot here. So in this, uh, in this uh, fascicle that Dogen wrote, what I got from it was you had, as the cook, you had to treat your ingredients with a lot of respect. Whatever ingredients you had, no matter how good or bad, a lot of respect. And he said for the vegetables, like treat them as if they were your eyeballs. Yeah. So it's like, Okay, very carefully, very carefully. In the Tenzo Kyokan, Kyokan uh, Dogen has a couple of stories where he meets, uh, he's, he's on a journey from Japan to China because he, there's something, you know, uh, that wasn't fitting for him. In Japanese Zen, they said, you know, you're already perfect as you are. And he said, well, if I'm perfect as I am, why do I have to sit? <laughs> That's a good question, right? We're perfect as we are. Why do we have to sit? And so he had heard there was a Zen, mas Zen masters in China that he had to go visit to see if they could answer this question. So um, he went to China. I mean, it was a long journey, I don't, rough ocean. I don't know, it took a month or something like that. Very perilous journey, right? So he gets there, and it takes a little while for him to get the OK to go see the Chinese Zen master at the monastery. In that time, he meets a cook who comes from the monastery. He's very excited, right? He's going to meet the cook. <clears throat> so here's a story from that. Dogen says, I was moved with joy. I served him tea 
and we talked. When I referred to the discussion of words and practice, which had taken place on the ship, I think they had talked before, the cook monk said, to study words, you must know the origin of words. To endeavor in practice, you must know the origin of practice. And I asked, what are words? The Tenzo said, one, two, three, four, five. I asked again, what is practice? Nothing in the entire universe is hidden. That was his answer. Nothing in the entire universe is hidden. And Dogen continues, he says, we talked about many other things which I will not introduce now. If I know a little about words or understand practice, it is because of the great help of the Tenzo. I told my late master Myoshin, who he did meet, about this in detail, and he was extremely pleased. So Chris gave a great talk last week about what practice was, and it wasn't a test. <laughs> Meditation is not a test, right? It's just practice. And, you know, uh, sitting on the cushion is definitely uh, an important form of meditation. But what else is practice? It's... It's not just when you're sitting on the cushion, right? So later, Dogen found this verse, and he was really happy because um, he felt that when he read this verse by Secho or Zhuido, he felt that he knew all the more that the Tenzo was a person of the way, a person of the way. And this was uh, written somewhere in 1100s. <clears throat> the Black Dragon Jewel. Through one word or seven words, or three times five, even if you thoroughly investigate myriad forms, nothing can be depended upon. Night advances, the moon glows and falls into the ocean. The black dragon jewel you have been searching for is everywhere. Black dragon jewel you have been searching for is everywhere. Now we know about dragons and how they love their jewels <laughs> and how they hoard them, right? <laughs> but this black dragon jewel is everywhere. Can't hoard it. So, the, what is this black dragon jewel anyway, right? What is it? <sighs> so, Ed Brown, continue, continuing to read this wonderful book called no recipe, <laughs> he says, love what, love what is precious, what is healing is everywhere. When you hold the moment close 
and are willing to receive the comfort and love that is available. This is the jewel, Lo according to Ed. <laughs> love, what is precious, what is healing, is everywhere. When you hold the moment close and are willing to receive the comfort and love that is available. So nothing in the entire universe is hidden. Nothing is hidden. Which means, according to Ed, that it's no secret that money and accomplishments may not bring you love or the feeling of preciousness inside that you have been searching for. It's no secret that when you focus on one thing, everything is included. Like when we say, if you're practicing one precept, non-killing, all the others are included in it. Or if you practice one of the um, seven perfections of a bodhisattva, like to be patient, all the perfections are in that, as you're practicing patience, right? Because I think Patience especially is a favorite of mine because I seem to lose it a lot <laughs> trying to grasp it. Uh, I think one, um, you know, there's, um, I think there's a natural compassion, but you have to activate that compassion to practice patience, right? We all have it, but how do we actualize it? How do we realize it? So, Ed continues, what you've been searching for is everywhere and does not depend on your performance, but on your willingness to receive the treasure that cannot be earned. Oh my God, let me say that again. What you've been searching for is everywhere and does not depend on your performance, but on your willingness to receive the treasure that cannot be earned. Ed continues, in the kitchen or out, when you give your heart to something, you feel your heart. When you let things come home to your heart, you feel the love from beyond. I'll read that again. In the kitchen or out, when you give your heart to something, you feel your heart. When you let things come home to your heart, you feel the love from beyond. So it's that opening right of the heart, opening, opening, no matter what, no matter even when things get really dark and hard, Right, that's the time. Oh, wow, can I open my heart really now? I don't know. But that's what, um, that's what fearlessness is about, right? We're cultivating fearlessness on our mats to open even when we don't want to open. Another story from No Recipe. Uh, when a student at Tassajara, which is a beautiful place, 
when a student at Tassahara asked Suzuki Roshi, why haven't you enlightened me yet? Why haven't, ha have you thought of that question, those of you studying with <laughs> Roshi and me? Why haven't you enlightened me yet? And uh, Suzuki Roshi's response was, I'm making my best effort. I'm making my best effort. And it found this to be a phenomenal expression of love. Right? Of not being hooked by the student's thinking. It's interesting, of not being hooked by the student's thinking. The question seemed disrespectful as well as, he says, ill-considered. I mean, whose work is it, after all? Your enlightenment. <laughs> In fact, we could say that everything is making its best effort to enlighten you. <laughs> right? The black dragon jewel is everywhere. It's everywhere. And so, who is not letting enlightenment occur? <sighs> enlightenment in everyday life. What a what a concept. <laughs> So I wanted to also <clears throat> mention that May begins Asian Pacific Islander Month and Desi Month. I wish I'd, I learned. Desi includes uh, South Asians, East Asians, Southeast Asians, and Pacific Islanders. So I think it's wonderful that we have Chinese and Japanese ancestors in our lineage, in our genealogy that we are learning greatly from about um, how to wake up, how to wake up. We're enlightened, but something's not happening. <laughs> and that's why we sit on the cushion or sit in a chair. Not so much to be enlightened, just to see our enlightened nature, right? Just to see it. So I'm also uh, pretty busy right now because I have begun with eight of my students a hula intensive, much like the ango that we do here, you know, where we're intensely practicing. We're sitting more, you know, we're doing services regularly, not every first and third, but every week. Um, we're studying something, uh, sutra or something. Um, we're just really practicing intently, intense, intensively. Um, and so I am doing this for my eight students. Hopefully, it's a, it was, we started last month, so it's a, I hope we finished in August, which will be five months. And so these students are really putting their heart into the practice, which is what we do when we practice intensively. We have this aspiration, intention, and then we follow through. That's what we do, we follow through. Our word is important here. When you give your heart to something, you can feel your heart. When you let things come home to your heart, you feel the love from beyond. So genealogy is also very important in our hula practice, just as it is in our Zen practice. Um, I've been reading another wonderful book called Voices of Fire 
by Ku'u Aloha Ho'omanavanui. And that name is an incredible name. She teaches at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Ku'u Aloha means my love or my deep compassion. And Ho'omanavanui means to make patience, to be patient. Isn't that an incredible name? Ku'u Aloha Ho'omanavanui. And she has written a magnificent book called Voices of Fire, which traces from a native Hawaiian perspective the history of Hawaii. Um, you know, the, the kings, and then she calls it the Western invasion that happened in the 1800s, right? That totally disrupted, though the Hawaiian um, culture at that time was also going through changes. There were uh, mass changes in the way they did things, like one thing they changed, um, which kind of upset a lot of things, was men and women ate separately. There was a kapu, uh, there was a kind of a boundary there. And then one of the queens, after Kamehameha the first died, changed that and said, no, we will eat together now. So that changed a whole, you know, that caused a huge ripple effect. And so when the Western missionaries came, right, with their one God, the Hawaiians had many gods. Uh, and, and for them, they had a direct relationship with the Aina, with the earth. That was where they came from. So that's in their genealogy. So they have this um, great respect in terms of caring for their ancestor, the earth. Anyway, she um, does a brilliant um, kind of historical uh, um, explanation. Um, there is a, uh, the Hawaiians were just brilliant. They put together a kumulipo, which is the story of creation. And um, where it says the Hawaiian people are literally born from the land. And she says kumulipo is a cosmogonic genealogy that established the foundation of the Native Hawaiian culture as one generated through succession of birth that originates with the birth of the universe. I'm just blown away by such brilliance, you know, and they go through uh, Po, the darkness, which is where everything came from, and then they go to the, um, you know, the life forms we know, they starts with the coral. So the native Hawaiians maintain pono, which is in the name of my school, halau ika pono, to make right, um, uh, to be in balance, in harmony with, said, uh, uh, they made pono with the environment by taking care of and love of the land, love of the land. So mo'oku auha, which is their word for genealogy, go, w r runs through everything. The kinship between the aina, the land, the ali'i, the royalty, the akua, the gods, and with each other. And hula, uh, Amy Stillman, who's an ethnomusicologist uh, in uh, Ann Arbor, um, she um, got her PhD from Harvard. She says this of Hula, performances constitute not only instances of communication,
but also over time, recollection and commemoration. The corpus of poetic texts for Hula constitutes a storehouse of cultural memories that are collectively celebrated by perform performers and audiences alike. Though hula dance and through hula dance and song, memories of people and events endure long after they have passed. Performances are moments in which remembrances are sounded and gestured. So there was, it was an oral culture, but when the missionaries came, they taught the Hawaiians how to write, which was really important actually, because the oral history was dying out as with all the changes that were happen, happening. So in a short period, like 95% of the population became literate and they wrote millions of pages of this genealogy that used to be oral into this vast corpus of literature, which is amazing different points of view, different, all kinds of, anyway, so they're still translating it, actually. So um, my students are learning how to make different um, instruments. They're learning, memorizing chants, memorizing dances, in this cultural practice, that I'm trying to close a link between Hawaii and Chicago for the future here, because um, I think uh, that's important, because here I am, <laughs> far away from home. <laughs> here is a quote from Zen Master Dogen. Do not wait for great enlightenment, as great enlightenment is the tea and rice of daily activity. Do not wish for beyond enlightenment, as beyond enlightenment is a jewel concealed in your hair. Beyond enlightenment is a jewel concealed in your hair. Again, right? Every day life, it's right here. <laughs> it's right here. Hey, right here. So, um, as I'm, <clears throat> this is Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander Desi Month. I received in the mail from one of my friends and also from Mark Galula a a uh, Gaza zine, Gaza zine, about Gaza. And, um, you know, I haven't, you know, it's there, right, in the background. And I haven't really been thinking about it, but it doesn't matter. It still, it still is affecting me, right? This this uh, violence that is going on there. And in this beautiful zine that I got, um, Bikyu Bodhi had a wonderful article in there. And Bikyu Bodhi is a Theravadan a monk. And um, I didn't even know that he was of Jewish heritage. <laughs> You know, but I know that Roshi really likes Bikyu Bodhi. I, I love the things that he has written. And um, when, after the conflict broke out, you know, he was surprised that Buddhist voices were a little silent about the issue. And so he, together with Alan Sanaki, a friend of ours who is the abbot of the Berkeley Zen Center, put together a petition and sent it out to um, the leadership. And 2,000 um, signatures came up and was sent to President Biden. 
So the, the wonderful thing about this article was he talked about the ethical teachings of Buddhism as providing the pillars of a strong moral framework from which uh, shapes our engagement with the world, right? And as we're bearing witness to violence there, he said, the five precepts enjoin non-harming in body, speech, and thought, right? These five precepts, non-killing, non-stealing, non-misusing sex, non-lying, non-misusing intoxicants. These are five of the 10 precepts that people study who study Zen with uh, Roshi and I, right? This is our framework, a uh, kind of a moral framework of how we are to be. How can we be awake uh, in our world? Also, Buddhist social ethics advocate nonviolence in resolving conflicts. Right, that's a big one, nonviolent. We've got a wonderful uh, upaya, nonviolent, uh, nonviolent communication <laughs> that is trying us, trying to help us be nonviolent in our speech with one another. Right, doing no harm. Uh, and then the Buddha enjoy, uh, he says, non-killing is not only a personal endeavor, but it's also a duty to prevent killing by others. And I remember a story uh, when the Buddha was alive and he was asked to consult. The two tribes were going to start warring with each other. And, and one of the tribes uh, asked him, the leaders asked him, you know, what do you think about this? And the Buddha was really clear and, and told him, you know, do, do they have feelings, you know, like you, you know, we're all human. And he was able to prevent that conflict from happening when they saw, yes, they're human, yes, you know, we have upsets and we can solve them another way. And also Buddhism extols the divine abodes of loving kindness and compassion in ethical uh, as ethical ideals and themes of meditation practice, right? Loving kindness and compassion, those are big for us. And the bodhisattva vows commit us to saving and liberating countless sentient beings from suffering. So all of that, <laughs> you know, how do we, these are, our, these are our foundational practices here. How do we deal with something like Gaza? And when I look at the statistics, I just, I just cry, basically. How many people have been killed? What percentage are women and children on both sides, right? Um, how many houses have been destroyed, buildings have been destroyed, and now it is, they're calling, uh, I don't know, the World Food Council, whatever, saying mass famine is happening now. This is like, in our lifetime, this, this is happening here. So Bhikkhu Bodhi recommends, right, joining marches. I mean, there's, there's a lot of unrest happening on our college campuses, right? Writing to the White House uh, and, and our representatives in Congress, you know, just speaking up because silence can also be taken a certain way as well as being complicit. So um, 
in this zine also, um, Thanissara, who is a, um, again, a Theravadan nun, had this beautiful prayer that she closed with. So I would like to close with this prayer as well from Thanissara. It's called Namo Quan Shur Yin Pusa. We bow in reverence to the compassionate one who listens at ease to the sounds of the world. O oh, Holy One, we are lost. Please bring your presence to us now. Please bring your merciful healing to all bodies, hearts, and minds. We call on all Dharma protectors and benevolent forces of protection. All Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, enlightened ones, saints and sages, divine beings, and all celestial guides. May your benevolence shield all from harm, within and without. Let the light of awakening dispel the shadows and liberate all pain. To the elemental protector spirits and ancestral guardians, to the great Nagas, dragons, and healing forces, we offer our invocation. May your healing powers flow through the sacred web of interbeing, washing away all suffering. May the illumination of pure consciousness within all guide us toward compassion, love, and peace. May all that binds us in fear, hatred, and delusion be replaced by courage, love, and clear knowing. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Dharmo Sangaya. We pray for the true freedom of all beings united in the sacred dance of life. May this prayer resonate deeply with all hearts, uniting us in service of peace and healing. I have the microphone here that I could so, pass yeah, around. Any, any, any comments or thoughts or questions? Thank you. Those online, feel free to just unmute and hop in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, June. Um, I'm I'm sort of hanging on in my mind to early in your talk when you when you read the piece about there is nothing hidden in the universe. Is that how it was said? Yeah. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like a koan. Yeah. Um, but of course. Of course, I know that. I, I mean, that's part of the practice is knowing that the Dharma is everywhere. And, and yet, it's so interesting to me how just hearing things said a little bit differently sometimes will uh, fire, light it up in me, you know? And uh, it's a really good, uh, it's a really good notion to take away into the day. So, thank you. That was really, really beautiful. Um, I was struck by the Gaza in and um, Gaza Zine. Gaza Zine. C I N E. Yeah, it, it, it kind of describes that feeling where you, you carry this in your heart. It takes part of your life. You can't really explain it. But I wondered if you could say more about that. Well, I mean, yeah, we're all interrelated, right? So, yeah. I mean, just knowing that all that is happening, that destruction and such suffering. We talk about trauma in America. I mean, all of those people there must be totally traumatized. And, and what does that mean for the future generation? Yeah, we're having a hard time here in America, and 
<laughs> you know. Yeah, thank you, Roshi, very much. Uh, just one quick uh, anecdote from early after the conflict started over there. And we go to the Jerusalem Cafe in downtown Oak Park uh, frequently over the years. And we've come to know Muhammad there, the owner, a little bit. And so one day I was waiting for my order and I just, I was thinking, do I say anything to him about this or not? And I, and I did, and he was willing to talk about it. And then he's also working. And he just basically summed it up by saying, they have nothing. He said, they have nothing. He's Palestinian. You're talking about his family? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ken? And then Susan online. Thank you, Roshi. It's, it's beautiful today, and, and the, the, the Gaza piece has been something that I've been... It's the first time I've really borne witness to a conflict um, starting the week before it started. I remember the Dharma talk I was giving before I went to Auschwitz, where I was saying that when people know, when two sides both know, and they don't engage in not knowing, that's where, con and I used Israel and the Palestinians as an example, and then I was in Auschwitz sitting when that happened. And one of the things that I've noted is the, for lack of a better term, the zeitgeist of everybody chooses sides, okay? If you're Jewish, you believe this, and if you're not, you, and that in and of itself is traumatic because there is a large and growing Jewish population, particularly in the United States, who's saying, you know, there, ha there needs to be a ceasefire. You cannot continue with this in this way. And it goes beyond right or wrong. I consider it like a communion of wrong. Everybody gets to be wrong. But eventually you all have to say, I'm going to stop doing my wrong piece. And that's hard because... We, our ego gets up and we do that. So it's been a, it's been a difficult thing to, to bear witness to. And, and you gave it a beautiful perspective. So thank you. Now, Hawaii evidently just passed a resolution to, uh, for a ceasefire. Um, let's see how you would say it. Uh, there. <clears throat> They passed the Hawaii ceasefire resolution, the first state legislature to do so, calling for a permanent and immediate ceasefire in the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. So they are demanding that President Joe Biden's administration facilitate the de-escalation of hostilities to end the current violence promptly send and facilitate the entry of humanitarian assistance into Gaza, including fuel, food, water, and medical supplies, and begin negotiations for a lasting peace. I mean, they're the first, you know, to do a resolution. That's something, you know, so. I think there are just a few people, uh, you know, they're legislators who said no. Susan. Thank you, Roshi June. Thank I'd you. like to go back to some, can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. um, when you were speaking about Ed Brown and no recipe, uh, focus on one thing, everything is included. And I thought, what, here is another Buddhist paradox, you know, I mean, it's so <laughs> So I'm looking out my window at my neighbor's garden hose that's curled up and I'm focusing on the garden hose. And then I, without looking, saw the tulips next to the garden hose. And then I see their car. And then I, still looking at the garden hose, saw a hawk fly by and the hawk is nesting out here. And, you know, I started thinking about peripheral vision and the 
relative in the absolute. And I thank Diane Miogetsu for her incredible course. But can you say more about that? Uh, and that being focus on one thing, everything is included. Hmm. Um, I guess for me, it is like when I practice one of the, um, the bodhisattva practice, right, of perfection, as I was saying, um, to be patient, right? So I'm focused on patience, my patience, or lack of, <laughs> and I'm trying not to judge, uh, you know, a lot of things going on in my head. Um, and I find that in order to do it well, I have to, one, it's helpful if I'm rested, you know, it's helpful if I have been sitting regularly because then I'm clear. So I'm trying to practice patience, but everything else is also included in that. Like when they, uh, um, if you're sitting, you know, you're not practicing to awake, you're just practicing to, well, you're just practicing. And then some things become clearer, like your peripheral vision you're talking about, like, oh, okay, I have to go to bed earlier. I have to stop watching Hulu and Netflix. I have to just cut it out, basically, okay? Then I will have enough sleep, <laughs> basically. So these little awarenesses come up. Uh, that's how I see it. It's kind of like the, these, you know, it's there, the answers are there for you, but you just can't seem to grasp it and then actualize it. Mm -hmm. uh, is that helpful? Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it seems to be a matter of settling and seeing something or observing something. Mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Roshi. I really enjoyed the part of the talk too, similar to like what Susan is saying, um, but just about that part that when you're able to open your heart, there is all of that love from beyond. And then that brings forth that compassion for the patients we so need, but it's all tied up in there. I think that's really lovely. Yeah, and uh, you know, being curious, having a sense of humor, you know, they're all part of this, right? Yeah, being able to, um, you know, be a little loose. <laughs> Not so tightly wound up. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? Well, with that, thank you. Roshi June, those of you who are here, please join us for uh, Kinship Hour in the community room. Zoomers, have a lovely Sunday. So glad to have you with us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming, Susan, Patricia, Xu Ping from far away. Yes, nice to see you all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so grateful to see you all. Thank you. Yeah, take care, Patricia. Great to see you. Are you doing all right there? Still <laughs> vertical. So that's, that's my story. You're what? What was that? I'm still, I'm still vertical. Okay, upright. that's good. Yay. Upright. Yay. And <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> it's all very good. Okay. Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.